Web3 Spaces, guys. We, this is like a genre agnostic hub where we're building content around uh, everything within Web3. We want to be focusing on thought leadership and leave people with more than what they came in with and uh, new ideals, new thoughts, and new safety measures to be able to operate this crazy world, which is Web3. And we appreciate the speakers so much, and we just appreciate the followers, guys. So today is horror and help. I don't know, Drew, if you want to break it down, I can break it down, and we can kind of go through it. And um, we'll keep it small, keep it sexy, and kind of grow as we go. Yeah, absolutely. No, definitely appreciate it. I was getting some DMs. Uh, that made sense. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, this is kind of just a, a series we're throwing together, right? Kind of a educational security kind of, you know, cool space to pretty much, you know, I think everyone's kind of had some experience, unfortunately, with either, you know, being, being drained, being scanned, being hacked or knowing someone who has. And uh, this is just where we can kind of openly talk about it understand how we can avoid it, share stories, so we're all aware of how to avoid that moving forward, and um, kind of give some tips and tricks on how you can avoid it, uh, just completely in general. Yeah, definitely. I can kind of kick. I can kind of kick us off. I, I got drained once in the ecosystem, and then uh, I almost got drained twice. But I was like, "You guys are not feeling when you start to get like a, a little suspect. You're like, I'm feeling a little strange now. I'm feeling suspect about the scenario." I remember I was um, I was working on NFTs, and do you guys remember um, pumpkin heads? I don't, I, I don't know. It was kind of a, they were exploding. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember pumpkin heads? Okay, yeah, they were exploding in the space in the beginning, and uh, they basically were right, right away on purpose. They they disappeared. They deleted everything. But um, I was in their Discord, and basically they were they were interviewing people for a role, and so I was like, oh, okay, cool, absolutely. So these scammers they get on call with me. They 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 jump on a call. They're showing their faces and they're interviewing me for a job and I was like oh this is legit after they interviewed me for the job they're like we love it they were asking legit questions they had a real company they had like a real twitter I was like these guys are truly pros come to find out at the very end of it they send me a file like if I didn't already have like a general I don't know if you guys have uh, Drew and, and Mikhail and, and Tropic and everybody here if you do you guys have that general like just um, distrust like that that camera covering that that phone locking away feeling <laughs> in web 3 because that's that's basically I leaned into that feeling because after the interview went great got the job <laughs> um, they send me a file they're like hey open up this file and it's going to have basically the software you need to operate within our ecosystem. We have some, you know, basic, I think it was like scheduling software or something. It was a zip. And I remember seeing a zip and I was so suspicious. I was like a zip file. This is, this is strange. I messaged them. And at first I wasn't that weird about it. I was like, Hey, got a zip file. I don't want to be, cause I don't want to be that crazy person with the job, you know, where I'm like, Hey, I don't open zips. And they're like, okay, this guy's lost it. So no, I messaged them back just to be, like kind about it you know what's up guys everybody that just came we're talking security um nifty and basically telling horror stories of what happened in the past and you know drew is going to give some expertise on basically how to avoid this stuff i don't know if this one can be avoided but so i'm feeling suspicious so i messaged the company you know quote unquote and i'm like hey guys no big deal you know and i, I don't want to be crazy here um but uh is there any way you could send me the file not in a zip but then send it in a different way and basically, they ended up uh, saying, they're like, oh, man, you've already got the file, yada, yada, yada. Come to find out, I'm like, okay, guys, come on, like, please, can you send it not in a zip? I'm not just going to open it up on my computer. They wouldn't do it. And finally, at this point, I, I that, that sinking stomach feeling is setting in. And I'm like, dude, I think I just spoke to scammers for like an hour and a half. And I just got a job with some scammer out of Russia. And um, they wouldn't send me the file. And finally, I was like, are you guys scamming me right now? They totally broke character. And they were basically like, it works on most people, yada, yada, yada. And it was just so surreal in that moment. The flip from them being like people that had a job to like actively scamming you and talking in that in that reference and I basically just opened up a conversation I was like how are you doing like is this working out well for you I was just curious about it as a whole so I'm not sure um what the fixes or an avoidances are for like that type of scenario because it's not like a regular drainer but that was like one of the most recent stories of, of me almost getting ripped off yeah, I mean it's good. It's good you recognize that. I threw some up up top as well. So this is this is a pretty common social engineering scam. 
Um, unfortunately, they they post a lot of these job sites on like Crypto.com, Web3 Jobs. They even post it on Facebook, um, Instagram, LinkedIn. I mean, you name it, right? And everything seems so damn legit. Like they send you a questionnaire. Um, they ask you for clarifications on questions to make sure that you qualify. They ask you about what state you're in, uh, about taxes. I mean, all this kind of stuff. And then like the final, the final missing piece to kind of solidify it is they will hop on a call with you. They will go ahead and spend two plus hours on a call with you. Pretty much just like concluding your final interview stage. Like it, it's insane. The links that these people go to it. And then always, 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 always. The end goal is for you to download, whether it's special communication software that's encrypted. Did he, did he rub? Is it, is it him or is it me, y'all? Can you right. Did he rub? I think so. Drew, you rubbed on us a little bit. We lost you. You're going through a tunnel and a Tesla. I'll just add real quick. I, I think Please. that a lot of the scammers are, are, are getting very sophisticated and uh, just a little context for those that are listening in. So I, I'm Mikhail. Basically, I help to secure Web3. I do that over at Certic, which is uh, one of the leading Web3 security companies. And you know, our team is uh, seeing a lot of interesting uh, tactics to try to scam users uh phishing attempts is obviously not specific to web3 but it, it happens a lot in traditional tech and also in web3 but uh also we're seeing this like rising trend in hiring actors right um if you watched like on netflix like bitcoin i thought that was a very interesting show because i didn't really know too much about that whole story and I mean, they weren't necessarily actors, but in a way they kind of were just because they had zero knowledge of what they were doing. They just put together a project and <laughs> were building it on the fly. It was kind of interesting, but more and more we're, we're seeing actors being hired. Uh, so you really, as a user, you got to do your due diligence. And this is why, I mean, because I work directly with uh, a lot of projects, this is why we always recommend, especially if you're just starting out as a project and you don't really have the reputation of, uh, you know, some of the big players in the space, highly recommend get, getting KYC'd through like a security provider uh, and just having that validation there for the, for the users, it instills a lot of confidence in the community that, okay, I may not know who this person is, but I know they have been verified. Because the verification process, depending on who you go with, can be pretty thorough. So if you're an actor and you're trying to portray yourself as the founder or the CTO, you if the KYC process is done correctly, it will be very difficult to be able to outmaneuver an investigation team that is specifically trained on conducting these KYC procedures. So definitely want to start with, like as a user, you definitely want to start with your basic, uh, you know, is there a, does the link work to their profile? And then go beyond that, right? Like, do you have any mutual connections or, uh, you know, does, is anything about who they are, their LinkedIn profile, does any of that seem fishy? And, at the end of the day, you got to trust your gut, right? If something seems off, uh, to your point, Wolf, when you were uh, first uh, teeing up the story, if something seems off, you got to read into that and not take any chances. Because right now, uh, well, before this little mini dip that we've had, uh, there's just been a lot of froth in the market, a lot of greed in the market. Like everybody's aping into these meme coins, and everyone's just kind of doing things aimlessly. And we, get, we just got to remember that when we get really greedy that way, that's where the people that want to take advantage of that, that's, that's where they smell blood in the water, right? So always protect yourself. And especially if someone's out there trying to walk you through making a transaction, you know, especially now when we have airdrops and with airdrops also come a lot of scams. So just everybody just needs to slow down a little bit like the bull market is here 
for, I mean, I don't know, now we're getting into predictions, but I anticipate, this is my personal opinion, for, you know, at least another year or so. Like, let's just be diligent, let's be cautious, let's protect ourselves and have fun in the process, so. Yeah, definitely well said. You can take it, Drew. Either or, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, mean, I was just I, I, always I, I, to my last part. I think I got Twitter's been bugging. Can anybody else hear him? Me. Yep, I hear him. I don't. He's quiet to me. Oh no! <laughs> Twitter spaces yeah. for the win. Yeah. All right, Drew, you take it away, man, and, and give me a thumbs up when you're done, and and uh, I'll use uh, uh, telekinesis to figure it out. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, yeah, a lot of this is going with your gut, and, and a lot of it is education, and, and I think a lot of this comes back to, like, uh, understanding, like, if you are using a tool, like, in, in, in uh, Wolf's example, like, the way to protect him there, even if he were to download that file, unfortunately, is like an antivirus, right? So, like, an antivirus is malware, right? That, that's kind of one attack vector. Um, that's different from, like, uh, a security wallet extension, um, like wallet guard, right? Like wallet guard is not an antivirus. That's like a transaction simulator or a proactive security. Like there's different, you know, there's different kind of tools that you can use in personal security to kind of own these things. And if you don't have the proper education, well, then you don't really know exactly, you know, how these things work, what it covers and, and okay, if you go with your gut, that's great. But what are tools or what are things that you can check to make sure that so you don't have to download it to confirm that it is it is malware. So, and most of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, your gut's right. And um, if you aren't ever sure, I mean, always join a trusted group. Um, like because you know, I know you, you do a lot with with Certic, so I'm sure you know they could always ask you in, in some which way. Um, you, anyone can also always join the the Boring Security Discord um, and ask in there if they aren't sure. That's a total free resource, security classes, education, those kind of things too. Um, so I think that's, that's really what the space is missing is kind of trusted advisors. Um, cause if you try to tweet this out or, you know, someone thinks they know what they're talking, they give you the wrong advice. Well, that could be pretty detrimental. Yeah, absolutely. Drew. Well said. Uh, I'll also add in terms of tools that, uh, people can utilize, um, to prepare themselves. You mentioned some really good ones like wallet guard in terms of like, you know, protecting their, their wallet. And, um, also just with me working more on the project side, uh, in terms of doing your due diligence on the project, you know, I spoke about the team, but I will also say if you go to skynet.certic.com, that's a really good tool to utilize, to understand in terms of like, what are the potential risks of interacting with those smart contracts? Um, what I like about Certic is their ability to take very technical information and be able to apply, just make it a lot more digestible for the everyday user. And if we're talking about onboarding the next billion users, we have to make it very digestible, right? Um, if the focus right now is on better gameplay, better user experience, you know, better UX, UI on the application level, making it a lot more user-friendly, if we're going to be talking about those things, we also have to talk about that when it comes to security, because people cannot just read a very, very technical audit report. And there's a lot of great auditing firms out there. They do an amazing job. They're very talented. And I think sometimes we need to understand that it's great that we have that technical expertise, but we have to be able to relay that information in a very simple way in a very illustrative way. So the audit reports, although it sounds very intimidating, uh, I can at least speak for, like on the CERTIC side. They're very user-friendly to read. They're very visually appealing. And you've got a lot of other information that you can look into, right? I mentioned the KYC badge. Um, you could also look at the security score, which is comprised of a lot of different aspects. You've got like the code security and then also the operational resilience and the fundamental health. There's a lot of different components that go into security outside of just the actual code. And so the skynet.certic.com leaderboard, where you have not just projects that have been audited by Certic, but um, pretty much any project that you can think of, if they're deployed on chain, 
most likely there's some information out there about them. And if not, I also recommend getting in touch with uh, CERDIC, whether it be through Discord or Telegram, um, so that way we uh, you know, are aware of that project and we can get the most up-to-date information uh, online and you know have a security score for them. Yeah, I was going to say, what do you think, <clears throat> Mikhail, is like, like really the, the, the easiest scam that people are pulling off and then the fix? Or what are you seeing on the more elaborate side where it's like, okay, this is a little bit hard to watch. Like, I feel like with the job scam, it's a, it's a little hard to watch out for. Like, just to, like you really have to, it depends on the sophistication. If it's really, really, really high levels of sophistication, you start getting this issue where he's going to leave and come back. He couldn't hear either of us, by the way. Um, and if two Drew couldn't. So when you get to these levels of sophistication, that's, you have to start like training people socially that they're going to really understand. Here we go. You have to start training people socially that they're going to understand what to look out for. Like I was watching a guy on YouTube and uh, basically he's used to be a security specialist for World of Warcraft. And he was talking about, he said a lot of, a lot of these social scams, you can't just put like uh, tools or SAS in place to protect these people because they're social. You have to like, train the people on how to think and how to be like critical thinkers in comparison to kind of just following along. Because he said people that are lackadaisical are typically the people that get scammed. So for you guys, Drew, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Okay, nice, sick. Okay, let me invite you guys to co-host. What's up, Michael? Welcome, man. Happy to have you. I'm sorry, I'm going from like one security space to the other. It's like an insane day today, but um, I was like, I gotta make it. I gotta leave. I'm sorry. So, uh, what's going on, fam? What's up, dude? No, you're totally fine. I was. <clears throat> we were kind of just going over. I had told a story, and we we're kind of going over some, some security stuff. And I was going to ask the question to to y'all. You know, when it comes from <clears throat> like a social uh, hacking point, and I'll, I'll rehash and reiterate just a little bit. But it, when it comes from a social point, like I was watching this video with a guy that used to do the. Um, security for world of warcraft and he was saying a lot of times with social hacks you have to train people to think critically it's not so much that you can put a software in place to, that puts safeguards because people typically like whenever security happens people get lackadaisical or kind of lazy about the process and what it's actually supposed to look like for the security measures and, and sometimes like the software can be the saving grace when it's like drainers and actually click throughs so i guess my question is like what are you guys seeing uh, as far as scams like really low level stuff that people are following falling for that's a, that's a software fix and what are you seeing on like the high level scale where it's like you just have to teach people critical thinking there's there's not really a, a software side fix to that type of scenario and you know i guess this is like eight questions in one so there you go but um as far as like you know the critical thinking side what type of thought processes do you think? Because I know that there can be like a mental checklist. I have one for myself before I start work, you know. So do you think that there's like a mental checklist when people are going into scenarios or high risk scenarios in crypto that they can kind of go over to alleviate? And I think that's like four questions in one, but tackle which, whichever one you guys would like. Yeah, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of it is keeping like a default in your head as far as, you know, how do you set up your device the right way so you could degen safely? And then what are the things that you have to remember on a daily basis? Because at the end of the day, like we don't want security over convenience and convenience over security. We need a happy medium. So at Wallet Guard, what we really focus on is giving you both the tools and the education. So simple tips like always go to the source, don't entertain what you're being solicited by, combined with you know, what we do with the wallet guard tool and how it breaks down if a website's recently created or if there's a wallet drainer on it, we're going to get users as close to 100% as possible because at the end of the day, we say it all the time, nothing is 100%, but if we have the right tools and the right education, we can get users as close to that as possible. So really what it comes down to is a lot of it's social engineering and phishing. You're not actually dealing with hackers. You're dealing with scammers or script kitties that paid $50 to spin up a fake drainer or to uh, get a script in order to attempt to scam you. So really, it, it, it's just a matter of not thinking it's not going to happen to you because it's only a matter of time before it does. 
unless you have the right education and security in place. And, you know, we take a lot of pride in making sure that we made WalletGuard as user-friendly as possible so that you're seeing exactly what's going to happen in plain English before you hand it off to your preferred wallet. So it's a security layer on top of whatever you're doing, just like an antivirus is for your computer, which, again, most people don't even have antiviruses. This is the scary part about it. People don't web two before they web three. They're walking into a space where you're about to be your own bank, and mind you, banks have multiple layers of security, but you do not. That is a setup for failure. So we could change that sentiment if we talk about it and we employ these tools because they take seconds to enable, and you don't got to worry about clicking wrong links. The point of the internet is to click on links. You don't have to worry about signing the wrong signature because we break it down into plain English before you open it in your preferred wallet. And look, people are going to listen to this recording. There's going to be listeners in the space right now listening to this. They're probably not going to care or do anything or even take a look at WallGuard until they get drained the first time. That's just human nature. But let's be proactive about it. Let's change that. Let's make it so that not every person has to get drained before they learn something in the space and that when they do onboard people, they know exactly the right tools and education to forward them to. Mikhail, you're good, but I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah, that, that, that was uh, well said, Michael. And you know, Wallet Guard is a, is a great tool. Uh, recently, I was doing a uh, podcast uh, with a blockchain investigator, and we actually talked about Wallet Guard and uh, so th this is, again, just my my personal take, right? Not a representation of um, CERTIC, but um, it, it, Wallet Guard is pretty well respected in the space. And I do agree that uh, the users need to be proactive and, and, you know, instill that kind of practice. Um, there is that social element that we'll, that you mentioned, which is uh, referred to as uh, pig butchering. It's a very common tactic, just taking advantage of, uh, lonely people that may be seeking, you know, like a romantic relationship. And it, it may sound funny to some of us, like, why would anybody fall for something like that? But there are a lot of people, um, also a lot of people in crypto um, that are dealing with issues on the mental side of things, right? They may be introverts, they don't really get out much. And the whole process of pig butchering is you fatten a pig before slaughter, which sounds very aggressive but essentially you know what these um uh scammers would do is they're they're very highly trained to build a relationship with you give you all the compliments right and and once they have that trust they will instruct you to do certain things so you know if anybody's applying any kind of pressure or making a recommendation walking you through a specific transaction that that should be a red flag and then as a user, I mean, goodness gracious, there's a lot of things that you have to keep in mind because assuming that everything, the transaction is accurate, there's still some red flags potentially, right? Uh, because on the smart contract side, you could have uh, centralization concerns and it all depends on who that project is. So if the, if the project is reputable and they have some privileges, uh, privileged functions, that may not be a big issue. But if you're interacting with a smart contract where on the surface, it seems like this is a legitimate project, very reputable, they're on one of the hottest chains right now, everybody's, you know, interacting with them. And they could essentially have certain things in place where they may be able to just drain that smart contract and so there's a lot of things that you have to worry about and so in that regard that kind of goes back to my point about looking at audit reports because in the audit report it's not necessarily telling you did this project pass or fail an audit it is it just tells you the current state of it and that's very important to differentiate because the smart contract could have a lot of issues it could have a lot of risks and it's up to us to be educated enough to understand what those risks are and are we willing to take on those risks. So if there are centralization concerns, which tends to be the most common risk, and again, even you can be the most reputable project in the world, you could still have that centralization risk. 
because technically it is a risk. You have certain uh, privileges that have not been renounced. And it's a lot of effort for projects to be able to renounce all of their privileges and to fully decentralize. You have to have a time lock. You need to use multi-signature wallet. You need to renounce your privileges to a DAO. It's, it's a whole process, and not every single project is going to go through that process. So it's up to us to be educated enough to understand that these are the risks when interacting with these smart contracts. So this goes back to, is the team KYC'd, or are they publicly facing? Uh, you know, How much are we willing to trust these projects that, are, that we're interacting with? And so, you know, Wallet Guard is a very good first step. The social aspect of it is also very important. And then the third aspect, just going back to the whole audit reports and understanding where the risks are, all of that needs to be applied. And it sounds very intimidating for somebody that's just coming in. And I think it's up to us that have been in this space for some time now to continue to educate these new users that are coming in because we want to be able to grow and the only way for us to do that is for all of us to stay safe yeah one, one of the problems though is that the sentiment from web 2 is coming into web 3 and the sentiment is web 2 is to not care about anything to hit agree and accept and allow on whatever pops up on their screen so they can move on to the next step and a lot of projects just don't care about security. They care more about getting a chief vibes officer than they do a chief security officer. So really what it comes down to is like, let wallet guard be your project's chief security officer. Let our resources and our tools help guide your users that are bringing their hard earned money into the space, keep their hard earned money in the space. And a lot of projects don't realize that when someone gets scammed in the community, and their NFTs or their tokens get floored or, or distributed. That's affecting the project as a whole. You're actually setting up your community for failure by not talking about security first. And the other, the other side to this is, of course, people think security is insanely complicated, that it takes a million steps to do and it costs a ton of money. That is not true. Security should be something that you could sit down, you could set up the right way, and you could move on forward and you have a completely different sentiment when it comes to securing your assets. But again, human nature is to not care. Most people are not going to get wallet guard until they get drained the first time. Most people are not going to care about backing up their files until they lose their files. And how do you change that? This is why it's proactive, right? We got to be proactive about this. If you're onboarding a friend, a family member, you're not talking about security with them, you're doing them a disservice. You're setting them up for failure. And I think that. We're trying to make it easy so that you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to deal with the phone call the next day where they're telling you they lost everything. This is the exact reason why we made Wallet Guard, like I said before. So projects really need to wake up. I personally will not invest into any project or buy anything from any project if I see no mention of security, because then it really seems like all they care about is money. They don't care about the actual assets or utility or keeping that into, in people's pockets. So... You know, this is this is really what's separating the real from the grifters and the LARPers at this point. <laughs> yeah, I really think <clears throat> so. Kind of to sum it, sum it up, I, I was just kind of <clears throat> thinking as you guys were speaking, <clears throat> and I guess one of the main issues is that, like, when you buy a home in the United States, you don't buy a gun right away. Why? If somebody breaks into your house, you have somebody to call. That person that you're going to call is going to come to your house and they're going to rescue you from a bad scenario. Well, in Web3, there's nobody to call. Nobody's going to rescue you. Nobody's going to protect your house. Nobody's going to protect your funds. And I think that that's like, because I was like, man, well, <clears throat> yeah, we can get the tools. That's the easy part. But how do you teach them how to think? Because if you ask people like, hey, are you ready to protect your family? They're like, no, I'm ready to call 911. Like, well, why? I think most of the time in Web 2, what it seems like is that people are used to having governing entities and governing bodies that are going to give them safeguards and protection in place to make sure <laughs> that they're going to be, you know, covered. But in Web 3, I think it seems like first things we say, right, when somebody gets onboarded, like, listen, 
it's this is not web two. There's nobody to call. There's no police officers. And I know you think there's always a governing body. There's somebody to go to. There's somebody to call. Somebody to make a request with. And that person is going to bail you out of the scenario that you got in. And you can afford ignorance. Ignorance of protection. You can afford ignorance of ability. Ignorance of understanding the companies. Because there's the SEC. There's police officers. There's all these people. But in Web3, there's none of those governing bodies. So your ignorance cannot be afforded in this space. And I think that that... <clears throat> maybe I'm wrong here, guys. But that seems like that's first conversation. Like, right when you bring somebody in. Like, you cannot think like you thought in Web2. There is none of those people. The question is, is how do you keep your assets, your mints, your whatever safe because there's there's nobody to kind of come in and, and bail you out. So LKM, I, I saw you come up. What do you got? Hey there, how are you all? Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. blessed. Okay. I just left Target and got in my car and I was listening to you guys because you know how Spaces Now is the new Spotify. And I'm like, oh my God, these are my people because I just love safety because I... I listen to all of you, actually, and the speakers there all the time in things because I'm a huge safety advocate myself. I'm no expert or anything, but I try and tell as many people as I can as possible because it's so frustrating, isn't it? Because people just um, don't start with safety first, and they need to. Um, I've heard you, Michael, say it multiple times. It isn't a one-day occurrence. You've just got to keep doing it. You've got to be vigilant day in, day out etc and i'm not here to shill a project believe me but i just wanted to give you a heads up because i actually am in a project i'm more on the social media side not telling you to buy anything i just want to tell you what we do because it is one of the puzzle pieces that's going to help safety as well so i'm part of a project that is a, a ai powered trading platform for DeFi, but it has predictive ai um it is proprietary um, and what it does is it is looking for behaviors and searching for smart contracts. So once you enter the smart contract, it can search for behaviors and detect if there's going to be a rug pull situation. And it does it 98% accuracy. Right now, we're just on Ethereum, BSC. We started with those two because that's the majority of where the rug pulls are happening, the big boys. We've just added Arbitrum and we're about to expand to another chain that's under um, beta right now. But what we also do, the kicker, because there's a lot of scanners out there, right? And I don't want to talk too much, sorry. Just want to share it with you. There's a lot of scanners out there. But what we do, we take it to another level, is we disable the swap function. Or I not, not we, I want to say our AI does, because this is non-bias. There's no human influencing this. There's no FOMO influencing this or any kind of, um, you know, influencer of any kind. It's purely AI, non-bias information. And it's not just spewing data at everyone because everyone can do that. This is actually determining the behavior, identifying what's going to happen. 98% accuracy because nothing will ever be 100%. If it is, you should run for the hills because it's not accurate. And what it does is shuts down the swap disable and will not let you buy that token. It's not going to happen on our watch. You can go elsewhere and buy it, but we're going to stop you from buying that token. And we do it before. Typically, it happens. Obviously, we can't tell you exactly when it's going to happen um, because it depends when you run the contract on our scanner, obviously, or on our browser-based system. But what happens then is we stop it, and it could happen minutes, days, hours. We've caught it up to 30 days in advance before. So we're kind of a small, we're a small, big project, if that makes sense. <laughs> we are kind of in our bubble. Not a lot of people know us about it, about us yet. I kind of want to yell off the cliff tops a little bit more, but it's amazing what we can do is simply a few seconds to use it. It's robust. It's free access. We do have a pro level that has some more extra warning features available, but our massive feature about disabling the swap the ai detecting disabling the swap that is free access because we're really really strong about everyone having access to having no barrier to safety but i just wanted to share it not asking you to do anything i just want to share it because i know we can save people from red pools well, and and you know it, it's such an interesting point because i think there's a lot of things uh, that a lot of companies can do. Now, obviously, they mm -hmm. need to decide whether they do it or not, where we have to use these kind of behind the scenes. We have to use this kind of technology because that's yep. how advanced a lot of these scammers are, right? Like if, if oh, I'm yeah. a normal user and I'm looking at something, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that I'm not able to yep. tell whether, whether yep. it's a scam or not, right? So 
you know, again, just like Michael was saying, you know, it's good to hear y'all are incorporating security. It's good that you care about security. That's that's absolutely yeah. awesome to hear because that's something that's that's super, super, super missing. Because um, again, you know, I think every single time, you know, someone unfortunately gets scammed or something happens, the very first words that I hear ninety nine percent of the time is, "I know what I I know what I did wrong and I know what I should have had." Yes. Right. Yeah. Like, I know I shouldn't have done that, but you did it. Right. And then the yes. next, the next oh. question always is, is there any way I can get my stuff back? And the answer is no. Like that's just exactly. not how the blockchain works. Like it's decentralized. There's no nine one one number. Yep. Like that's why you know, exactly. be, being proactive, screaming from the rooftops. That's yep. that's why it's super important holding spaces like this. Yep. Just uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things like that. So NFT, Drew, don't you just want to like? reach through to those little people showing up on your phone screen and shake them. <laughs> Cause it's like, be an adult, be responsible. I mean, I used to work in the automotive industry. Um, I don't know if, how many of you are in the U S but with a company called Lojack and it was all about um, protection for, you know, getting your car back from stolen, blah, blah, blah. And I know it's not crypto related, but it is related because it's about protection and theft and everything. And I used to train, you know, rooms of people of hundreds of people and try and explain this is you've got to take a layered approach you know when you go home at night you don't leave your door open right you lock it and maybe you have a dog and maybe you have an ADT um, sign up in the front of your house um, you have a light outside that comes on automatically you have a ring doorbell you have all those things for a reason because it's a layer the more layers you have what is that saying fence and depth the more you do that the more likely they're going to the next door neighbor that doesn't do that so you have to protect yourself. You just can't be that naive anymore. And not that people deserve to get rugged because we have to educate the new people coming in and save them from FOMO because that's what they're getting hit with first. But what we really need to do is somehow get them first that safety is first. Let's not teach them how to initially, you know, attach their credit card or their bank account. Let's talk safety. And Michael, your product, Wallet Guard, I love it. I only have a personal my personal um, process is I do not do any transactions unless I'm at home. I don't do anything on my phone, but I have my Chrome extension and I love it. Um, I think I even do pretend transactions just to do it sometimes. <laughs> but um, it's just amazing and everyone needs to use it, seriously. It needs to be like, um, I don't know, it just needs to be um, policy. Can we make a policy? Can we make it a default? <laughs> yes, yes. It needs to be like... I mean, I have a personal friend in real life, which is rare in crypto, right? And he's had a ledger wrapped up in a box for probably a year and a half. And he has substantial assets. And I can't, I just want to slap him because he hasn't bothered to take it off a burner wallet. I'm like, you're absolutely stupid. But some people just don't listen. You can't help stupid sometimes. So we can only help the people that want to be helped. Yeah, but I mean, that's some some lessons are learned through failure. Some things. Yes. Oh, so yes. I, I feel like both both are important. Yeah. I've learned through failure my whole life. I've, I've you know, one thing I was going to say I was going to take a little bit of a contrary point. Do you do you, so with the AI software? Do you shut the mint down completely in the company? Like, I guess my my, my wondering is is like. By shutting a mint down, it, you inherently kind of hamper decentralization a little bit because the point is that there's not central entity. And I realize like we're we're pretty far from from um, decentralized at this point, especially going proof of stake. And you know, basically, you know, if if a company has a long term vision, it's going to happen whether or not there's consensus. It's going to happen whether you know because now we're we're POS in, instead of proof of work. So, I, I guess, do you feel like that kind of hampers the idea of decentralization to shut down companies from being able to go from one to zero or zero to one, you know, with whatever their metrics may be or their, their AI. Um, um, well, we're not shutting down the actual mint, so to speak. We're just saying that we um, say that um, we're recognizing there's a problem here and we're disabling the swap um, because we recognize there is an issue. We also kind of have a degen mode where we're saying we actually are recognizing dangerous behavior. So you may continue. This is the second part of it. We recognize this dangerous behavior, so we do recommend you do do more DYOR if you choose to continue. So kind of like a degen mode as well. Um, so we're not shutting it down completely. We're disabling the SWAT like not on our watch because with our 98% accuracy, 
we are protecting people and I don't know, metric wise, the 98% is quite phenomenal. Right now we are actually um, behind this. I don't, shouldn't say I, we have amazing developers. Um, we're right now beta testing our next chain that we should be adding soon. And they're working through the level of percentages right now. And um, we're very particular where before we just throw on chains, we're not just like adding 30 chains. We don't want to be like, the cookie cutter scanners out there, we're adding on with accuracy because accuracy is what matters because there's no use scanning and not staying behind your results, so to speak. And there's nothing to say too that we might, the AI might recognize the behavior that's dangerous and maybe later on it isn't dangerous, but most of the time it will usually continue down that dangerous path because you might have a locked ether situation. You might have um, external calls, all kinds of things that are happening. And those are things you can flag and see on a static contract sometimes, even before it's launched, but it's the behavior. So with our AI is detecting this when people with human eyes are seeing trading patterns that looks good. You're seeing green candles. We're already seeing red. So we're protecting you against it. And nothing's perfect. Nothing should be. And I know when I get a chance to speak in projects about our, um, in spaces about our project, I'm a big believer in having multiple layers, have multiple products. Not one thing can do everything. So you just got to layer up. But thanks for letting me um, do my little, not spiel. I, don't, I hate calling it a spiel. I just want to share and help people. Yeah, it feels a little bit like Minority Report. It's like, oh, they, they, they may be a scammer. <laughs> We don't know. Let's shut them down just in case, unless you do degen mode. It's kind of crazy. And I, I think, like, you know, eventually <laughs> this is what's going to happen across the board. Like you see in China with a social credit score, not to make a correlation because it's not, but, right. you know, like basically people will get like a, um, a placement depending on behavior and that behavior will give them a, a, a um, like an end result depiction, not really on intention, but just on, you know, you hit 10 out of 10 on the behavior thing. So I was going to segue it a little bit. So I'd love to hear from like Michael, Drew, Mikhail, like, you know, one of like, <laughs> did you guys ever get scammed and what happened in the space first experience? Yeah, and I guess like um, kind of gut feeling and what was the change after that? Yeah, I'm going to uh, knock on wood and say that I haven't been scammed. What? Are you, you've not even, have you been close? Um, yeah, I, actually, there was one scenario where I was really close. Um, I had met up with one of my business partners, and this was when it was like late 2021. Everything was going crazy. And my business partner was like, dude, Gucci just did this drop. Check it out. And it looked so real. And I was like, this literally looks like Gucci, the domain, everything looks official. And it wasn't. And I was out and about and doing this on a mobile device. And I literally stopped myself before it went down. I checked the contract and I'm like, hold on, this is not fucking, you know, this is not Gucci. This is it's literally not Gucci to do this. So that was the only time that I almost got scammed. But again, I just double checked. I didn't FOMO in. I think that's really what it is. You just take a second to ask yourself, what the hell are you doing? And um, that's another thing that I just don't get. Like people get invited to conferences to speak on stage about security and they themselves have already been scammed. Why would you trust somebody that's been scammed already? Why not invite people that are making this their entire lives that have never, again, thankfully, because it could happen to anybody and we're literally dodging bullets on a daily basis. Why wouldn't you employ somebody that has those security measures in place their whole lives already? That takes it to the next level and really teaches people in a way that's layman because security can be very daunting. It could feel like it's a million steps and you don't want to do it. But again, that's what we do at WallaGuard. We make it easy. We make it easy to digest and easy to understand so that you can pull it off in less than a day to set up all your devices, your smartphone, your laptop, your desktop, your wallets, managing your passwords, using an antivirus, having an ad blocker. It sounds scary, but it's not. And you're going to feel a lot better knowing that you set yourself up the right way before you continue moving forward. So yes, the answer the question, I thankfully have never been scammed. Yeah, it seems like that general... Do, do you think if you didn't have that contract knowledge and, and you were kind of green in the space, they would have got you for sure? Like, oh, a thousand percent. Oh, wow. Okay. Got it. Got it. A thousand percent. If I didn't, if I didn't employ like 
what I've set in my head as a default. For example, like if somebody drops a new link and they're like, jump in the Discord, I'm jumping in the Discord. The first thing I'm doing is there's always red flags you could tell. For example, it says on the left hand side that there's 320,000 people in the Discord and then the user list has like 30 people on the right hand side. Like that's a massive red flag. Then you see that the link doesn't match the link that they have on their other social networks, massive red flag. You see that they don't have any sort of onboarding flow. They're not telling you to turn off your DMs, red flag. Same thing with Twitter accounts. If you see a post and the comments are off, red flag. If you see a Twitter account and you have no mutual followers, red flag. So these are things that are defaults in my head. And I think that if we talk about it and we have people understand, hey, this is the things you should look out for before you ape into something, then we could really change the landscape of people compromising themselves, people interacting with the wrong accounts and literally willingly like scamming themselves, letting it happen. Yeah, dude, that def <laughs> definitely that's well said because it, it really does. It feel like it feels like ignorance is is pretty much the almost the number one culprit to like every single downfall. And it seems like it's the zero to ones that are getting the brunt of it. Because once you go from three to five, you know, and I'm talking in, like intelligence, you know, once you go from three to five, you start to really mitigate the issues. So I think the onboarding process needs to be clear. You know, maybe there's like a company that builds out like a huge thing. It's like, welcome to Web3. Every company funnels into it and you have like a school or something. Uh, that won't ever happen because there's just too many vectors to bring people in, but at least something like it. So yeah, Mikhail, do you, is there any stories, dude? Anytime you almost got hacked, got hacked. Uh, did you get accepted to a job in Russia? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely been, uh, I would say there's been some, some close calls. Uh, fortunately, I have not been hacked, but you know, just because I work for a cybersecurity firm, it, it doesn't mean that I'm immune to it. I think anybody, it can happen to anybody. So if it happens to you, you know, and you feel like, why me? Or, or you know, don't be so hard on yourself. Obviously, it's mentally draining. Besides your wallet being drained, just draining all across the board, right? But um, I, no one's above this, right? And so the best thing that you can do is just be educated. But my mentality as a whole has always been, I'm just naturally, even in real life, if I'm out and about and I'm, I'm always aware of my surroundings, I'm always skeptical of things. And, you know, there's only certain areas where I feel like I don't have to have my guard up, right? And so I think you just have to tread carefully in, in Web3. And if you don't know something, there's a lot of information online for you to be able to have access to it. Just look at things on YouTube, you know? You can easily get educated. And I personally think that the same way we don't think twice about putting on our seatbelt before driving. We can get to a place where this just becomes second nature. I'm very confident that with the technology, the, the direction that we're headed, it seems like every cycle, like every time I go to a conference, there's new developments. The games are becoming better. Uh, I use the uh, reference on games because I'm currently at GDC 2024. The games look amazing. And so just as a whole this industry is moving forward it's becoming more mature and so we will get to a place where having these things do become second nature it's just is going to take a little bit of time because there's a, a huge learning curve here but i'm sure when seat belts were first invented it wasn't you know people were still thinking twice about putting it on you know it's easy to do you just reach over and click and that's it you're done but people didn't make it into a habit and so it's going to take time for us to make it into a habit and so i'm confident that we can get there yeah i've got kind of a hot question so i guess like the, the topic is centered around like you know zero to one adoption and like loss of ignorance in the space and therefore that mitigates you know um hacks, flaws, social engineering, yada, yada, yada. Do you think for the space to really onboard, because with the NFT craze and the crypto craze, what ended up happening, everybody gets onboarded in the ecosystem because everybody wants the monetary win, which is already just a little bit of hysteria. Add a little momentum, add a little bit of hysteria, people are feeling it, you know, they're just, they're, they're happy-go-lucky. Do you think the space 
will be at a standstill and a stall point until the same mentality where you can have and be afforded ignorance, just like Web 2, where there's governing entities, is going to bring about mass adoption? Or do you think it's these little moments for people taking them from zero to one? Because to be honest, I'm a little bit of a bear. I think, honestly, I don't think this moves the needle. I think we have to have, I don't believe that people are going to get raised for 30 years living under that ignorance governing body kind of style and then be able to switch over without being able to like really change as a person. And, and I think, I don't know, I, I, I believe we may actually have to have more web to like centralized structures and decentralization really doesn't work as a whole, especially when it comes to security. So what's, what's everybody's takes? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, um, it's a matter of like, when I'm explaining crypto to somebody that just doesn't understand it or wants to learn about it, I'm not even mentioning crypto. What I'm mentioning are things that they're familiar with and getting them to think outside of the box. And this is an example that I bring up all the time. So if someone says, well, crypto is confusing. Okay, let's talk about what you're familiar with. You want to go to a restaurant and you want to buy food. When the bill comes, you have a debit card or a credit card that's made by Visa or MasterCard. That's one institution. Your money is sitting inside of a bank like Chase or Bank of America. That's another institution. Then there's a point of sale system, which takes a piece of the transaction and is also another institution. Then there's the merchant service provider, which sells the business, the point of sale system, which is another institution. And then there's the on and off ramps, which are other institutions. And then after three to five days, your money goes from your bank into the business's bank, which might be a different bank than your bank. So that's another institution. So this is what you're comfortable with. This is what you think is not confusing. Six to seven to eight middlemen, all seeing what we're doing, taking pieces of it and taking days to execute. Now let's talk about crypto. You walk into the same restaurant, you are your own bank. The business is its own bank. The money goes from you to the business within seconds, not days. No credit card companies, no banks, no merchant service providers, no point of sale systems, no on and off ramps. Now do you think about it differently? Because no one explains crypto to people like that. And when you do, they say, no one's ever explained it like that. That's really, actually, really straightforward. Now, it wouldn't be practical for this to go down 10 years ago, a decade ago, because the technology wasn't as far along. Internet wasn't all over the place and hardware wasn't where it needed to be. But now this is the next logical evolution of how we're going to deal with currency, assets, as well as data management. And another example that I give right after I give them that example of eating at a restaurant is your medical information. Think about all of the medical facilities that you've been to your entire life. You've been to doctors, hospitals, dentists, whatever. You've given your information to all of those institutions. You've given your social security number, your allergies, your phone number, your address, your credit card information, your name, your email, everything. You don't actually own any of your data, and you don't know how they're saving that data. They could be keeping it on paper. They could be handing it off to a data entry facility. They could be saving it on their computers or their servers inside of their office, which might be compromised, might have been compromised in the past. Who the fuck knows? So your information is scattered all over the place, and it's most likely already leaked. When do you get to own your own information? What is the reason for there to be these data entry farms and all of this paperwork and databases when all of your medical information could be held in a token that you own? And when you go to these medical institutions, you give them access to view that token, but not necessarily to copy the data over to themselves. Well, okay. Yeah, go ahead. But do you think that teaching people in that way is enough to promote mass adoption? Because right now what's happening is people are coming into the ecosystem. The ignorant get scammed, and if they have a stomach for it, they move on.
if they don't have the stomach for it, they call it crypto a scam. The narratives go out on the internet. The narratives go out on the news, the same ones we've seen a thousand times. And then they leave the ecosystem. The coin goes back up. People get a little bit jumpy again, and they jump back in. So well, well, you, they, think about you know, here, here's the thing is that is, is there's two different ways that people are onboarded into crypto. One of the ways is, yo, buy this coin. We're going to make a ton of money. We're going to get rich quick. Get this NFT. We're going to flip it. You know, that's one way. The other way is, why are you coming in and what are you buying and what's the purpose behind what you're buying? Do you have artists or musicians in the space that you like and you want to own something that you know is directly from them? Do you understand the coin that you're about to purchase and what the utility is behind it or the NFT project that you're about to invest into? Because then you don't have a scenario where at the end of the day, everybody's holding a bag of shit that they can't sell and they themselves do not like. So I think really what it comes down to is education, but education starting from school. What do they teach you about in school? They teach you how to be a consumer. They teach you how to be an employee. They do not teach you about investments, stocks, debt management, how to not get scammed, how to manage your own data, protect your own devices, the stock market, exchanges. This is something that is actually made in a way where you are meant to work until you die and you are meant to not really find anything out. So if we start at the core of it, which is how people are incepted into society, and maybe we focus on changing that curriculum, because as of right now, the curriculum is done on Twitter spaces for people that are disconnecting themselves from the matrix of nonsense that they've been taught their whole lives, which is literally a lie in and itself, <laughs> then we might have a chance of changing the sentiment of the space and people realizing what the technology is here for. It's not to get rich quick and exit and bring it back to fiat. I would never trade my cryptocurrency to a currency that is printed by the trillions and devalued on a daily basis and centralized and controlled. It is not logical for me to move money into crypto, then move it back into a fake monopoly system. If we can have people understand that the dollar that they work hard for every single day is literally devalued in front of them, it is printed by the trillions, that it is misplaced, and God forbid you're one dollar off on your taxes, it's your fault. Meanwhile, they could get away with Spending the money on genocide, spending the money on weapons, spending it on stuff that has nothing to do with you. And no one gets in trouble because everybody in the government and all the politicians, they're all angels and saints. They've never done anything wrong. They've never even had to say the word sorry. When is the last time you heard a politician say sorry? Now I'm going to go off on a rant and it's going to go away from crypto. But I think, again, bringing it back to the core of the issue, which is... It's a matter of how people are taught from the beginning, and it is going to be very hard to convince people of everything that we're talking about unless we break it down to layman's terms, explain to them what they've known their whole lives, and that there is another option. Because without blockchain, without crypto, there would be no other option. Imagine it didn't exist. We would be living in a society where there is no out. There's nowhere you can go and there's nothing you can do that isn't part of a centralized system. Man, that's, that's getting clipped and stuck somewhere. No, dude, that, come on. No, dude, that was fire. And you can tell, you know, like there's emphasis on passion. And um, I really think even for me, this is completely off base um, from, the, from the core topic. But I will say, like, for me, I started to feel this um, distrust for having my money in a traditional bank account. Something happened. And I don't know what happens along the way, but I was like, I, I remember sitting and I had my money in crypto and then I had my money in my bank account. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't feel good about my money in the bank account. Like they could take it, they can, they can steal it at any point. Like, and this just started to slowly happen for me. And I remember now I'm like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather keep it in, in, in crypto. <clears throat> and even though it's volatile, just the idea that it really is mine. It's not ownership controlled. Nobody can, I can't remember what it's called, but the government can, it's not garnish, but languish. I think the word is languish. They can take your money from you for whatever reason and they can pull it right out of your bank account so ownership is is, is actually just a feeling it's just the idea of ownership as long as you, you do it rightly 
But so, brother, yeah, the, the, the problem, one of the problems is though, is that people aren't realizing that their money sitting in the bank, they're making money off of your money and they're actually able to give out more than 90% of money than they have on hand, AKA creating money out of thin air while they fed, while the fed continues printing it. Well, if you're able to print it and create it out of thin air, why are you asking us for taxes? Because it literally is worthless. It is not logical at this point. It's gotten past that point in the 1970s when they went off of the gold standard and they did give the ability for banks to hand out more than 90% of cash that they have on hand. Now, look, this is a different, completely different <laughs> conversation than security, which is what we were focusing on. But I think it's essential, right? Like, for me, it was the wake up call was a few years ago. It was like about four years ago. I had invested into a few stocks. I invested uh, into GameStop. I got into GameStop at like two or three dollars. And the reason why I bought GameStop at, at such a low entry price was because they were talking about releasing a gaming platform to combat or to rival Steam, which was one of the largest gaming platforms. And over time, I noticed that the price of GameStop was skyrocketing. I mean, it was going from like ten dollars, twenty dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred, two hundred. And I'm looking at the news. And the price wasn't going up because they were building a good product. The price was going up because it was a battle against the hedge funds. Pe normal people realized that they had the ability to manipulate the market the same way that the hedge funds do. Now, the issue that I had was that as soon as people tried to sell their shares or tried to take out what they put in, they were denied. Uh, they were uh, stop trading, stop lo like it was literally something that the hedge funds controlled because they didn't want to shoot themselves in the foot. They didn't want to affect their own bags. So you're telling me in a stock market where I'm supposedly putting my money into and now I'm making as much money as the hedge funds are. I can't pull it out because I'm not a hedge fund, because I'm a regular citizen, because I was able to manipulate the market the same way that all these people do on a daily basis and I can't have a piece of it. Well, then it's completely fake. Just like the fiat currency, just like the banking system. And that's when I said to myself, I am done. I am moving whatever I have into something that I am my own bank. I am responsible for my own assets. And this is why I take security so seriously. Is because I said it before, banks have multiple layers of security, but people's knowledge about security barely moves the needle. When you're your own bank, you have to employ those same measures. And if you do that, your entire perception on life changes. You move different, you think different, and it's not a matter of having money or not, it's a matter of knowledge. Because at the end of the day, the money means absolutely nothing. And I said this on the Killer Whales TV show that actually just premiered, I'm on episode four, representing WalletGuard. One of the first things that I said is that if you took everything away from me right now, all of my physical possessions, whatever I have left in the bank account, all of my crypto, I would still be happy standing on a street corner with a sign that says, ask me about blockchain. And I don't want anything in return because at the end of the day, money does not mean anything. What means everything is knowledge and information. And if we're able to share that with people, then we could break out of the system that they have everybody tied down to where you're literally made to work until you die. Think about how many of our parents are still working. How unfortunate is it that even some grandparents are still working? What is the point of life? When all you're doing is working to pay bills, that's not life. And we have to break out of it. A lot of people in this space have already broken out of it. That's why we all think differently, but we need to bring this to the masses because whatever the government and politicians and media are bringing to the masses is the complete opposite of actually progressing the human race at this point. It's, it's literally embarrassing. Mic drop. Wow, yeah, dude. Mikhail, you're going to say something? You had your hand raised and crypto bill, you came up as well. So hit it, man. Yeah, Michael, man, with the mic drop. I love it. Um, speaking with a lot of passion, definitely resonate with everything that you said there. Uh, I would just say that security, when, you, when people think about security, they obviously think about the technical aspect of it. But security could also be protecting your assets, right? In crypto, especially, it, a lot of times it's not what you make it's what you keep and part of that is you know going back to what you said about inflation the real inflation rate is more like 15 percent and so if we're losing 15 percent of our assets 
I mean, what are you going to put that in, right? S&P, this is not financial advice, of course, but, you know, S&P 500, you might get 10 to 15%, right? So that's why I think more and more people are waking up to the fact that crypto could be an answer in a, in a lot of ways from a social perspective, but even just looking at it from a financial perspective and what it, what kind of security that can provide, what kind of protection that can provide, you can actually gain on your assets, right? Versus just break even if the true inflation rate is 15%, which that's what I, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they talk about it. Peter Schiff, who, you know, despite his thoughts around uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, I think he speaks a lot of knowledge when it comes to the problems that we're having in, at least in the United States side. And so I much rather listen to somebody like that versus listen to people in the government that I think are just trying to paint a pretty picture because they're trying to get reelected. Not not to get into politics, but brother, well, what like, it is. You know, you know what you know what the craziest part about it is, and people are so blind to it. This is something that is like let's even talk about the real estate industry. So let's say there's a million dollar house that you want to buy right now. Uh, six to seven percent mortgage rate. After thirty years, you're paying three million dollars on for a one million dollar house. The one million dollar house ten years ago was four hundred thousand dollars. You are paying four. You are literally paying three million dollars for something that's worth four hundred thousand dollars because of ten years difference. And they're telling you, oh, don't worry, the housing market, everything is great. You should buy property. That's how you make money, guys. It's it's a scam. It is a revolving scam. Everything that they have told us is a lie. Anything having to do with any industry that touches on human needs is a lie. Look at the medical industry. You literally have the insurance companies in the hands of the medical providers so that they have skewed the price of getting medication to the point where it's unaffordable unless you have insurance. That's a scam in my opinion. They, they, have, they have created a system where you have to use their services, otherwise there's no way you can manage to pay for it. They have gotten us into a circle of nonsense. They have, they have literally shoved this information down your throats. They've, they've shoved this information down our throats during high school and, and, and middle school. They said you need to go to college to be successful. You need to have a college degree. If that wasn't the biggest scam in the entire world. Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, I would hope that you go and get a degree. But for 90% of jobs, for 90% of people, the internet is, is a better resource than going to school and learning the same curriculum from some geezer that's on tenure. No offense. And at the same time, you're probably exiting that school with a degree in something that you can't get a job in that you don't even like to do anymore. And then you talk about student loans. Well, the student loans rates are through the roof. They have it set up in such a way that even if you paid the interest on your student loan, you have that debt until you die. And then they create the narrative of, oh, we're going to we're going to eliminate student loan debt for, uh, you know, uh, a million people or whatever. The, well, where's that money coming from? Why not instead lower the interest rate for these predatory student loans down to zero so that people can actually pay them? It's because they wouldn't make money like that. They wouldn't be able to funnel money back into their own pockets. Everything is about them winning in the end. They are literally sucking the money out of society so that at the end of the day, you feel like you need the government to help you, that you need them to take care of you. And look, if, if Twitter wasn't an area to talk about this stuff, you can't talk about it on a lot of other social networks. You're going to get silenced. You're going to get banned. Like This is the world that we're walking into, guys. Amen. Amen, brother. Um, I got to jump in, man. You just you're just pumping me up so hard. I'm a crypto billionaire. I'm I'm 57. Uh, my son is a doctor. He graduated Duke. He's over there at UCSF in his residency. We, I paid for his undergrad. You know, so he didn't pay a dime. I paid it. He's going to leave residency with over a half a million dollars in student debt a half a million he doesn't own a house the two cars that he has we got him you know he's married now he's 30 uh and we gave him those you know we got him those cars uh 
when they graduated, and they're old now. You know, he's been in college for shit. I mean, undergrad, master degree, med school, now residency. I think it's like 11, 12 years. <laughs> but he's, uh, it, it, it's uncanny. What I love about this space is 30 years ago when I read about Jekyll Island, the creature of Jekyll Island, when I read uh, The Debt Virus, uh, when I read all these books and started really understanding our monetary policy, and, and I do have a, a degree in finance from uh, from college, but I was like on an island. I was literally on an island. Like when I would talk about fractional lending and, and how it's a scam and, and how they have us conditioned to the point where they think they have us believing that 4% inflation is good. Another way to say that is every year your dollar's worth 4% less. When I, when I got my first, when I bought my first house, it was three times earning. So if I earned 50 grand a year at the time, three times that was 150,000 for a house. Today, these, these young people, it's 10 times earning. 10 times earnings. I mean, you have to make you know, a half a million, a million dollars a year to be able, to, like you were saying, a $400,000 house is now 100000 My fiat job in real life, uh, I'm Web3 a, a third of my time. I'm, in real life, I'm a contractor. I'm a home builder. I build thousands of houses. And, and our, our cost because the dollar sucks, it's just worth nothing. Our costs are just shot up since COVID, which makes us have to charge more for the homes. Well, that means retail has to pay more for the same thing just three years ago. I mean, just three, four years ago, a house that we were selling after, you know, building was 400000 350000 400000 That same house is $800,000. They've almost doubled. I mean, it's crazy. What I love about the space is inform people like you, Michael, and all. The, it seems like the crypto people, and I've been in since uh, really 19. I, I bought my first crypto in 17, but I didn't do anything with it until 2019. I really jumped in in, in 19 and started getting in the Web3 crypto space. But what I found is there are so many uh, like-minded people that know about the banking system, that know about our dollar, that know about fractional lending, that know that the Fed is a private entity, that the President of the United States doesn't raise the interest rates, that doesn't even, can't even tell them to print the money, right? It's the Fed, right? A private entity. And they, so it's really refreshing to me, an old dog in the space, 57, it's really refreshing to hear younger people uh, in this space, which is mostly younger people, 20s and 30s mostly, but it's great to see that you guys are, we're all taking control of this now, we're going to do something about it, and part of it is the blockchain and Bitcoin, right, and, and crypto, the fact that you are your own bank, and the, the fact that now you can get some of that lost wealth back because of crypto, because of Bitcoin. That's what I love about it. Here's the chance. Here's the chance to take some of this back. Here's the chance to get ahead of the curve. We're all in here right now together in this crypto space, and we have this opportunity. I'm good, right? I, I mean, I, I'm good in my life, but my kids need to be good. My grandkids need to be good, and it's been scary for all these years until crypto. So I appreciate you, man. If you're running for office, dude, I'd sign your petition right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, greatly, greatly appreciate you in the comments. And you know what I think, what I think it is, is like, they, they don't give people the time to have two seconds and two brain cells to rub together to even have these types of conversations because they literally have you working to pay bills. And the one thing that's like scary to me is how could you look at the state of everything and say, it's okay. And, and I'll give you like, like a, like a quick two examples. So we we are accruing debt on on like a level that has never been even fathomed before i mean we are adding hundreds of billions of dollars in debt on top of the debt that we owe which is going to be impossible to pay off 
And instead of looking at where the wasteful spending is coming from, instead of eliminating government institutions that literally do absolutely nothing for the good of the people and are just money funnels for the same people sitting in the same positions for 30, 40, 50 years that get absolutely nothing done, they keep on saying, well, we need to create this system. We need to, we need a trillion dollars for this and we need $10 trillion to fix the climate and this and that. But let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about the climate for a second, climate change. They're saying that they need X amount of money in order to fix climate change, and that money is in the tens of trillions of dollars. Now, the government and politicians and media, the media itself, they have such a large platform that they are able to get information out to the masses very quickly. So let's imagine that they had the ability to say a message to all of America. How much junk mail, physical junk mail, does everybody in the room here get? Probably tons of it. Tons of junk mail. And if you think about the people that live on your street, and you combine the junk mail that you all get on a monthly basis, and everyone's throwing this junk mail out, and it's going into some landfill somewhere... It's a lot of junk mail if you take all 380 million people in the United States. Now, nobody looks at junk mail. They just throw it out. And in order to create junk mail, they have to chop down trees. They have to use water to create paper. They have to use ink. They have to use gas to transport the junk mail back and forth. And then to transport it to the landfill because it brings absolutely no value to human society. Now, if the media and the politicians have this massive stage where they could say anything, and the world is going to end in 10 years if we don't do something about it, why wouldn't they just send out a simple message that says, hey, uh, this month is National Unsubscribe Month. Any mail that you get, call the number on the back of it and unsubscribe so that we could reduce the emissions from junk mail. That doesn't cost anything. Think about all of the gas, paper, ink, emissions that would be saved because the world's going to end in 10 years, right? No, that, that's not going to work. Okay, no problem. Fine, fine. Let's talk about water. Water is one of the most scarcest resources. Less than 2% of water is drinkable water. It takes 10 gallons of water. Anywhere from, I believe the, the number was officially 4 to 10 gallons of water to create 1 gallon of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola causes health issues, diabetes. Coca-Cola is kept in plastic. It's used gas to transport all over the United States back and forth. It fills up the landfills with a material that will take decades, if not centuries, to erode and go away. Well, remember, you told us the world's going to end in 10 years, right? And water is the most scarcest resource. So then why aren't there sanctions? Why aren't there bills introduced in order to limit soda companies from not only creating something that uses 10 times the amount of water to create something that causes health issues, but also causes a massive hit because of plastics and gas and transport? Because it's not fucking real. It is not real. The entire message about climate change and all the trillions of dollars and global warming, it's all fake. None of it's real, because if they actually cared about it, then people would wake up and say, hey, maybe they're not saying it because Coca-Cola and company lobbies to every single one of these politicians. They give money to these politicians to not say anything. Why? Because everything is a business, and that's why it's not real. Just like healthcare, it's a business. Just like education, it's a business. It's all turned in to a corporate business that is actually not in the favor of the citizens of whatever country you're in. And honestly, I think the best formula is to have a combination, some sort of hybrid model where you have elements of capitalism, you have elements of socialism, you have elements of communism, and that is what is going to make the most sense. You cannot lean in one way or another. You have to have a combination of all of them in order to make a society that's actually not only beneficial to start a business and create something, but also puts into retrospect the human nature of what you're doing and does it affect the growth of humans overall? Because all of the shit that we've been shoved down our throats up until this point has been a complete lie. And I think we're all awake to that. Dude, I'm moving to the metaverse. At least there, I know it's fake. 
instead of uh, being out here where it's all really fake and they're trying to tell you it's real. <laughs> Bro, you're, you're, you're like talking about crony capitalism at its finest. And sorry for interrupting a bit earlier because you were giving her. But uh, yeah, I, I love your passion around this. It's like... Yeah, crony capitalism is 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 a serious thing, and and when when we understand that perspective on anything in life is super super important. So, for example, like when you see something that's that's happening that's wrong, like for example, you have like rulers that are you know that the the, the cards are all stacked in their their hand, and the system set up not to empower people, not to be altruistic, but actually to be something that you know pulls the energy, pulls the life force out of people and centers it into, you know, small portions of, of society, whether that's, you know, uh, the, the ultra rich or, you know, the people that have the most power, uh, most influence or whatever. Um, so as a part of that, that means that if, if that's happening, like we're all becoming more and more aware of that. Um, if that's happening, then, uh, we have to actually realize that corporations and governments don't have our best interests and we have to actually, you know, look at self self governance and we have to look at actually realizing that we can't give our power away and it's only our own choice when we do give our power away when we actually depend on others you know full heartedly to you know govern us in one way or another whether it is the government or whether it's corporations or whatever and i'm not saying that all rules or all ways in life or all systems in life are faulty um it's not that it's it's more of a pick and choose type of way and realizing that we actually have to be the ones that do make decisions for ourselves because at the end of the day there's other things that play around us that are trying to trying to pull from us so in in society we've seen new new revelations and revolutions happening based off of people actually needing to break the rules needing to do things in a different way needing to act in a different way and typically if you want things to be different you can't do things in the same way to get a different conclusion. You can't think in the same way. You can't act or feel in the same way. You have to actually start to shift your thought patterns, your paradigms to then create a different type of system that works in a different way. So one of the beautiful things like what Crypto Billy was saying, and, uh, you know, I appreciate this conversation because obviously we're, you know, here and we're all into blockchain technology and crypto is like, because of blockchain technology, so much financial apparatus, so much financial exchange is currently happening outside of the current traditional financial system that can't be tracked or um, is, you know, under the guise of, you know, outside of the government's control or outside of, you know, corporate's influence, right? Even though Bitcoin is still predominantly controlled by, you know, the higher ups and people that have huge amounts of capital, um, same with MetaMask being controlled and centrally controlled by consensus, which is owned um, by some of the major corporations in the world. So, you know, there's still these major factors of, of big money, huge influence affecting even a place that's supposed to be decentralized, that's supposed to be, you know, um, democratically um, democratized in the sense of, of, of what we're trying to create and what Satoshi's, you know, uh, values were and, and ideas and ethics were. But there's still a way for the everyday Joe to come in and actually take part in something um, that they don't typically have the ability to take part in in traditional finance as an investor or as a retail investor. And maybe they're breaking the rules, maybe they're not breaking the rules. I'm not going to say one thing is right or the other. But they're, because of the decentralized factor and because of the technology that's occurring, even though major people that with huge amounts of influence and power and money are trying to control it, which now BlackRock is getting ETFs and buying up all the Bitcoin and taking control uh, of crypto in that aspect, there's still opportunity for the little person to come in and hustle and find ways and make connections and turn $100 into $100,000. And so... Technology, I think, in many ways will allow that, and I think I've never been one to follow the rules, quote unquote. I've been more of one to to look at the rules objectively, and you know, look at you know what works for me and what works for my family. Um, so there's there's the beauty in that aspect. But I appreciate what you're saying, Michael, because you the the, the truth is scary a lot of the time because people aren't there to uh, these governments and 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 corporations. I don't feel are there to to help us 
even though there is politicians and there is leaders that come that have good good faith and they start off good, the system is stacked in a way and built in a way not to serve the needs of, of the individuals because of the centralization. I believe it's hard, say, for example, the prime minister, the president, you know, how, how do they know what I need in my everyday life? You know, when I have a hard enough time knowing each day what I need, right? Well, they well, listen, know, that, 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 that's, pro that's exactly part of the problem. These people are not people like you and me. These people have been there for decades, guys. They've been there for decades saying they're going to fix something that they created themselves, that they continue to compound in on itself. You know, you know what would be a completely different uh, outlook, a completely different scenario that I always picture in my head? Imagine instead of having the politicians that we have now, which are, let's say, paid $150,000 a year, but their net worth is $60 million, $100 million, you know, that, that's fine. You know, nothing's wrong uh, with, with creating tens of millions of dollars out of thin air outside of what you're getting paid and no one questions anything. That's fine. But um, imagine instead of people that only cared about money and, and, and lobbying and taking untaxable donations in order to create these fake campaigns and pocket all the money. Like, let's pretend instead of that, you were able to find 300 patriots, 300 people that actually cared about the country, and you gave them that job instead. I would be one of those people, and I would not want to be paid anything. Why? Because if I'm making the country better, then naturally I am making myself and the life for me and my children better. There is an incentive for me to be a politician because it actually lets me progress the country instead of progressing my own pockets. But we are way too far gone from that. And that's why I do feel like within the next decade, there's going to be an awakening. There's going to be people asking, well, where exactly do my tax dollars go? And why exactly do I have to pay this much taxes? And who made up that rule? And who put that person there to make up that rule? Who, who said that that person's okay to make that rule up? People are going to start questioning things because it's getting to the point where it's too far gone. And because of the internet and because of crypto and blockchain, I think it's accelerating it. I think it's making it so that people are, are otherwise without it, like, you know, we would only be fed what we're, what we're showing on TV and only what they want us to see. But I think that this is where the catalyst occurs, is where people say to themselves, well, you're right. We've had the same people in the same positions saying they're going to fix the same problems over the past 50 years and everything keeps getting worse. And now it's impossible to own anything. And we're literally all working until we die, and we're working to pay bills, bills that go up indefinitely. The amount of inflation is through the roof. Well, what happened to taxation and representation? We're not getting that. We're getting, there's literally no taxation without representation at this point. So maybe, just maybe, within the next decade, people will question, well, why am I doing this? And why is it set up in such a manner? And who's benefiting from it? Because we as people are not. These politicians do not care about us. If they did, we wouldn't be in the position that we're in right now, which is literally something that we will never be able to pay off. We owe that money to somebody. That money that goes into these wars is going back and revolving into the same pockets. It's the same people. And what's the point of going to war at this point? What's the point of sending guns and missiles and ammo to two different sides and having them fight against each other. What's the point of it? Like at the end of the day, why don't the politicians throw on those backpacks, throw on those guns and go fight it themselves because they never would. If a single one of their family members was ever touched, you would never see the light of day again, but they're able to send people to be killed by the millions. It, it's, it's disgusting. It is disgusting. And I think human nature, the people in the right will eventually win. You know, the evil is here right now. But it's only a matter of time before the sentiment starts to shift and people start to wake up. And it's going to take decades, just like crypto adoption is going to take decades. I used to be a super decentralized maxi. I used to say that there should be no middlemen in anything. And this is going to, this is going to take a few years to come out. But then I realized that that's just not practical. There are people out there that don't want to be their own banks. They don't want to manage their own keys or seed phrases. They don't want to be responsible for clicking on the wrong thing, which is why some of these institutions are a requirement. They are intermediaries. 
They are, let's say, multi-sigs. They are institutions that are able to leverage the security aspect of what's happening. That's how you have mass adoption over time. And you also eventually have a split in society where there are people like us that understand the risks and want to self-custody that are okay with managing our own keys. And then there's people like potentially our grandparents or parents that don't want to deal with it, but they still want to be a part of it. They still want to own a piece of it. And this is why I think logically these ETFs and these institutions coming in is technically a net positive in some retrospect because it accelerates that growth to the point where we eventually see a 50-50 switch over from fiat being used instead to cryptocurrency. And again, it's going to take decades, but I can picture it happening. I definitely can picture it happening. It's it's a bit spooky, though. I mean, when you think of like a small portion of people, you know, being able to function in a decentralized manner and then the majority of people being in a centralized manner. And I and I don't disagree with you. It's just, for example, like that I made around how pretty much everybody here uses MetaMask. Right. And the majority of people don't know who actually owns MetaMask. And so like MetaMask, you know, being owned consensus, being owned by you know, major financial institutions in the world, you know, that MetaMask could be, you know, turned off at any point, right? And we could lose, you know, say, access to our funds that are stored in MetaMask, where majority of people that are in DeFi are using currently a software wall, which is typically MetaMask, right? So I'm but, not but really quickly, Poppy, just, just, just to, just to yeah, comment no on this really quickly. I think that consensus and the way that they handle MetaMask is actually a lot better than what I've seen with other wallets. They actually do give you the ability to opt out of certain data metrics and uh, anonymous usage statistics submission, which is something that a lot of other wallets do not let you do. So they actually do give you the control of being able to customize what exactly you're giving over when it comes to your own information, along with setting your own custom RPCs. Now, at the end of the day, MetaMask is also uh, has the open source initiative. And at the same time, your assets are not inside of MetaMask. Your tokens, your NFTs, MetaMask doesn't own anything. MetaMask is just a software interface to present your blockchain assets to you. You can take your private keys and seed phrase and import them into any other wallet. You can even do it as a base code level and access your assets without any software in between. So um, I think... You know, I, I, a lot of people don't give them enough credit, but I, but I would give Consensus and MetaMask a little bit of credit when it comes down to the open source initiative and also giving the ability for the user to opt out and also at the end of the day, not actually holding your assets, just being an interface to present your assets inside of. Sorry, I just wanted to. Yeah, no, no, thank you. No, I think that's amazing. I, I The knowledge is, is super important and I'm not going to take that away from them at all. I'm just kind of going back to the point of like um, that. So what I was saying about MetaMask and some of those factors, but also like say for example like BlackRock, Fidelity, like ETFs starting to come in as well too where there's a huge quantity of money being going in and a huge amount of control of market making from these larger institutions that pretty much own everything in the world. But on the other hand, like I'm agreeing with you as well too, centralization can be very important in, in regards to pushing technology forward so innovation can occur, right? So money coming into the space so that all of a sudden people like ourselves that, you know, have been struggling for years to make it work in DeFi or in the crypto space, you know, all of a sudden Bitcoin, you know, holds a, a stronger floor when, when the bear market happens, there's more capital in the space, there's more space, there's more money coming into the space that's staying in the space for innovation for projects to build, for infrastructure to build, for new for new narratives to build in the space as well too. I'm not completely against those things by any means. I'm, I'm very much, um, I think, in the in, in the middle of, uh, of most of it. I think there's good to to, to most things, but um, I just think that being honest and having that truth presented and all the information being there as best as possible for individuals to make the choices over to make the choice whether they want to hold their own information, hold their own money and work with their own stuff. And then also making the choice whether they want to give the power to someone else or not. Um, I think that having the choice is very important. I think this space really gives the opportunity to have those choices and to make those decisions for ourselves. But I just hope that more and more in the space that we can help empower people. I think we were talking about this last night um, about education being one of the, the most important things and, and people just having access to information as a totality.
because yeah, at the end of the day, shit's pretty fucked up in our world and we're in very challenging times and we have to worry about, you know, uh, we have to worry about nuclear war. We have to worry about, um, you know, we have to worry about very, you know, uh, end, end of days type of stuff where, um, we are worrying about how civil civilization is actually moving forward or, or sticking around or surviving, right? We have those things every day uh, that we have to worry about. So I think that, um, you know, this little sector that we're in in regards to finance and, uh, you know, f the, the fintech space specifically for crypto, if we're able to be in a position where we can make those choices for ourselves as best as possible and then leverage existing systems, I think that's great. So, yeah, no, I appreciate everything you're saying, man. And I think it's a great conversation and I, and I love how passionate you are about it as well too. Yeah. I'll say like, you know, lobbying for a lot of countries is illegal. You, you, you can't do that. And even like, you know, you're talking about like diet and like what they're putting in the food. And if you go over to Europe, like a lot of the um, dietary things that we put in our food is completely illegal. Like you can't do that in another country. So I do think, you know, I'm not one for like, and, and, and not to disagree with you, Michael, on a lot of points, and I'm not trying to be contentious. I'm not one for a they conversation. Like, I don't really believe in they narratives, like where you, you place some arbitrary person with responsibility, not to be, you know, contentious. But I do believe that money has gone to seed. I basically believe that, that it has become the, the, the entirety and the greed index for people is pretty much that entire thing. And what ends up happening is all the politicians got sold out. They Even the idea of lobbying, like, it sounds so strange. Like, co corporations are going to give money to politicians so that they don't push their narratives and they don't push their companies. It's like, hmm, well, that's strange. Well, why don't they just don't give them the money? Then they won't push their narratives and we don't have to worry about it. So so, no, I, I think in, like the, I'm, I'm going to pass it right over to you, Bruce. And if anybody has any, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, why crypto for everybody in here? Because it seems like there's different reasonings, but there is kind of this core distrust of the current system, which, I mean, to be honest, like, I didn't necessarily think that that was the hook, line, and sinker for most people in the space, like it, kind of a distrust in, 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 in central entities. But is that, I wonder if that's kind of the case for people as a whole, that it's not like just cool and, and new opportunities and people are making money in it it's that people kind of inherently do want to own their own assets and maybe it's a mix so yeah anyway bruce uh, take it away man what do you got i just want to say a couple of things all right first and foremost look up at the big screen don't be a fool wrap your tool with wallet guard okay you know that's right. what i am pushing this slogan i've made it up myself i'm proud of it uh I was in all these uh, these spaces earlier, just just ramming it down people's throats, trying to educate them on how important it is to have Wallet Guard to protect your assets. You know, we talk about the assets and scams and all. This. You know, where's the protection? Well, it's Wallet Guard. You know, don't be a fool. Wrap that tool. And then, hey, I ain't getting paid for shit. I'm doing this because I love it. And hey, and you know what else? I don't even have a computer. I'm on a damn cell phone, but you know what? I love the message and I love what he's doing. And I just wanted to give him some flowers and say, keep up the, you know, keep up the good fight. These people need to be educated. Um, but the reason I got into crypto is a whole totally different reason. I got into it because I suffer from PTSD. I'm a, a 12 year U.S. Army vet. Did two tours of duty over in uh, Afghanistan in Operation Drink Freedom. Um, uh, this is Web3, uh, NFTs, crypto is my means to uh, actually feel like I'm normal, uh, to be able to congregate or fellowship with other people. You know, yes, making money is great, and uh, and that's awesome. And and that's, I guess, the stereotype, typical thing. But honestly, I didn't get into it for money. I got into it for, you know, the, 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 the friends, the, the uh, connections, like... Some of my best friends in the world are people I've not even seen, met, or anything. Just hear their voice. It's like it's talking through this. You know, I, I feel more of a connect with Web three than I do in like real life. So, yeah, I mean that's why I'm doing it. Um, and I've gotten scammed before, clicking on a stupid link. You know, being FOMOing at the last second, not really, you know, doing my research, and and, and it got me once, but it ain't gonna get me again. And uh. I can't say that I have wallet guard because they're not mobile yet, but they're gonna get mobile. They're coming with the mobile. Uh but but until then, I'ma just, you know, I'm gonna keep repping it, I'm gonna keep pushing it, and I'm gonna keep believing it. 
So I just want to say thank y'all for letting me come up. And uh, yeah, let's do this, babe. Yeah, I'll greatly, I'll greatly appreciate you, Bruce. Uh, sorry, Wolf, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say you heard it, fear, heard it first, you know. Don't be a fool. Wrap, 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 wrap that tool. How so do you like that? You like that? Well, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I do. I, I don't know if I can shout it from the rooftop, so I'm not sure if the, the niece and nephew can, can hear it and they can they can say it to their parents when they go home. But I, I, besides <laughs> that, no I, <laughs> no, I definitely do. If anybody else, you know, has wants to come up on stage, give their, you know, reasoning why they came into crypto. We're basically 43 minutes past. We've completely derailed on, on a scale I've, I've never really seen before. But to be honest, I kind of wanted to let it roll because, like, I'm a big proponent of passion. And uh, like when we really started getting into the nitty gritty, I realized in the beginning, I was like, okay, we're talking about what we do. And then it got into now we're talking about what we love. And I was like, okay, here's the conversation. This is this is like the actual core of the nitty gritty where people are actually interested. And, you know, the passion lies. So yeah, stage is open. I'll let anybody request if you want to. Last thoughts, you know, final takes. You want to give it and Michael can... Go for it and, and give us the, the one to dude. If you run for office, you know, let, let us know. I'll have to silently endorse you because you, you sound like a militant, but um, <laughs> silently endorse you. <laughs> it was Wolf, no, Uncle man. Wolf, Uncle Wolf. I, it's so funny you talking about your, your niece and nephew and not, not yelling the, the, the slogan from the the rooftops and they go home to to your to your sister being like or your brother being like oh unky wolf told us to wrap our tools so that we wouldn't get in we wouldn't get in trouble oh you know the crypto space teaches the kids all the things that they need to know anyways right yeah it's so (laughs) that's so funny because um i was uh on the killer whales tv show uh they made me say you know (laughs) They maybe say a couple of things, but like regarding like don't raw dog the blockchain and stuff like that, which I, I say all the time, you know, don't raw dog the blockchain, protect your crypto. Um, Scaramucci was one of the judges and he's like, uh, what's the audience you're going for? Like, uh, you know, what are the nuns going to think when they're trying to get onboarded into crypto? Like, uh, what's Microsoft going to think when they're trying to put you in their operating system? Don't raw dog the blockchain. I was, I was dying laughing. I was like, I was like, look, there's two different messages, right? One message, which is the formal, corporatized, friendly to everybody message is protect your crypto. That's our slogan. But for the after dark moments, for the degen plays, for the back alleys and all that stuff, don't raw dog the blockchain, use wallet guard, or at this point, <laughs> what Bruce made up, which is the don't be a fool, wrap your tool with wallet guard. I mean, look, you got... You got to have those two separate, uh, you know, demographics. And um, I think we got the message down on both pretty, pretty straightforward. I, I think it's, it's very clear what WalletGuard does at that point. Shut up. I, ben, was actually, I, was I, I was so surprised actually to see WolfWeb3 up here in a space at this time. I don't know. It's like 1045 here um, in, in, on the East Coast of Canada. But then I saw, because uh, we were in the space last night together, Mike, and uh, is it okay if I call you Mike or Michael? It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but Michael, yeah. Michael's okay. Okay. Anyways, I saw it because we had that space last night with the torch and eight mother and stuff. And when I saw also Crypto Billion here as well, too, I was like, hmm, this looks like it's an interesting space. There's like, you know, maybe like 25 people in here. What's going on right now? And I didn't realize it was like a, a, a late night uh, wolf, uh, wolf space. So I love where you're taking it, Wolf Web 3. This is a whole different look. Yeah, no, de- this is definitely a different look. We we, <laughs> we typically try to run it like hyper-professional just because we work with companies a lot of times. But like I said, you know, this is maybe this, this is something we do each week where we bring people up and it's like a question like, why crypto, man? Like, t- tell us why you're here. Is it monetary? You know, is it passion? Is it, you know, future whatever? You know, is it to save your kids, protect your kids, actually have for me? Like, I like the idea of you actually being able to like, okay, so I believe in competition. Uh, and, and like competitive working and the reason why is because when competition comes out they restructure something so if you look at business so what ends up happening is when you have the first person to create a product they charge whatever they want for it especially if it's necessary then a competitor comes out and the competitor has to ask the question how do we make it for cheaper and how do we do it better then the next competitor that comes out asks the question how do we do it with a leaner company and how do we create the same product and then this keeps iterating throughout the process well this is why I love crypto it's like well if I want to go lend against you know 
$50,000 50, in the traditional space, I have to go to a bank. And they're going to have roughly the same rates across the ecosystem. It's like, well, if the banks fail, they'll kind of get bailed out, maybe, unless they're a huge bank like the, um, what's it called, the California Bank, which they shouldn't have been bailed out, but they were anyway because they were too big to fail. And it's already odd and strange, but you get the opportunity to be your own bank and be your own lending service. And I just, for me, I realize that people are going to fail and they're going to get scammed a thousand times and a million companies are going to iterate through this process and get drained 50 billion times across DEXs and sexes. But at some point, either we are going to be destitute and just broken <laughs> and limping forward, or we're going to figure this thing out and we're going to be able to kind of do this without central entities in a way that's smart and we're actually moving forward. And I believe like iterative processes through a competitive nature will actually get us there. And so that's, I always loved like the NFT space, to be honest, like I came in first to the NFTs and dude, I got ripped off like over and over again. I got totally disillusioned because I, I joined these teams and the teams, I, I, I come in as their marketing, social media marketing, all that stuff, branding. And I'd be like, okay, guys, so like, what's your financial plan? What are you going to do with the money? Yada, yada, yada. Like, you know, what's our runway? What's our burn rate? And they're like, wait, what do you mean? And I was like, well, what do you mean? What do I? <laughs> what do you mean? What do I mean? Like, like, what? How are you actually going to manage these funds? And they didn't know. And I realized at that point, I was like, okay, so the zero to one conversation between I'm not a founder and I am a founder is about three days, seventy two hours of time. And I was like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I, and like, it made me think. And finally, I was like, you know what? I like it actually because. Instead of you needing to raise, you know, $50,000 to, to, to half a million dollars in capital to open up a business, to open up a restaurant and possibly lose that opportunity, you can be 18 or 19 and figure out what it's like to start a business. Now, the problem is, is like, ultimately, I think that the expectations aren't there. And this is, I'm totally derailed, but the expectations aren't there because people will place these huge expectations on 19, 20, 22, and 23 year old first time founders and acting like they're like CEOs of fortune 500 companies. Like how could you rug? It's like, bro, do you not realize that most people that start businesses fail the first time and you act like it's not a normal thing to sunset a business and you want them to, to, to die on the cross over and over and over again for five years straight on a failed project instead of, iterate through the project and learn. It just seemed like a ridiculous notion. And when people sunset a regular business because it's not pseudo investors, it's no big deal. People just stop going to, you know, Piggly Wiggly to, to Sammy's sandwiches. It's like, oh, Sammy's closed. Uh oh. You know, I'm not going to be able to get my ham sandwich. But since people want to act like with NFTs and non-fungible tokens that they're part owner in the company, they act like pseudo stockholders and they place these unrealistic expectations on companies that there's no there's no checks and balances. Balances. And that's the cool part, dude. Like you're supposed to get rugged. Like the idea is you're supposed to get smarter. You're supposed to give opportunities to young people to learn this. And you're going to make bets and investments on young leaders and people who are learning how to do this. And so to be honest, I was disillusioned, but also at the same time, I thought it was incredibly cool that I was seeing people have opportunities to start businesses and communities, except people just never realized that this is what was happening. They put this web two sentiment on something that's just not web two. Bro, that was fucking magic, man. That, what you just said and how you just said it was like so well worded, dude. Like I literally you spoke to my heart so deeply. Um, there has to be some type of caption where we can take the recording and that needs to be marketed in some way somehow because it's like, that was so fucking brilliant, man. Literally a playground for innovation where people can get fucked left right and center and make mistakes and people <laughs> typically in this space when they make mistakes people forget about it and they move on they go to the next thing or whatever and if you haven't fucked up too too bad and you learn from your mistakes you can you know you can make up for it there's new people there's new communities there's new projects you can create it literally is a new industry that we're creating new playbooks for that are gonna that is going to affect a lot of things and we're already seeing the spanning of that into other industries but man you really hit the you really hit the mark there and i appreciate that so much because i've in my i i've in my life as a young man you know have failed a lot but with this when i got into crypto in 2018 i was like you know what this is a new industry and i know i'm gonna fail a lot because i don't have a financial background i don't have a tech background i don't know what the fuck is going on and this is completely new 
But as long as I stick with it and continue working at it and and allow for myself to fail, allow for myself to suck at things and just keep working at it, working at it, working at it, there's an opportunity to make something amazing here and help people, right? And as long as you have that intention, you know, that is the most important thing because we're, we're so much of the time, we're, we're supposed to be so perfect all the time and we're not allowed to fuck up and we're blah, 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 all these different things. But I fucking, like last year, I started with such a small amount of money and, you know, I've done really well with myself because of opportunity, because of learning, because of fucking up so many times before. There's nowhere else. There's not a lot of other places where you can start with next to no capital and find yourself, you know, in the position to be able to create something and be a part of teams and be working with people and and, and and all those different factors. So, man, I'm I'm literally going to listen to this recording again just to hear what you just said because it, it was really it really hit the ball for me and it, and it really it's helping me feel more confident about what's happening in this space because a lot of people are getting fucked around, but it's a part of it. <laughs> it is literally a part of it. Failing and getting back on your fucking feet and going for it some more because the, some of the best people in the space have heard some crazy stories about massive amounts of fraudulent activity, crazy scams, crazy stuff that's gone down. I've had a lot of it done to myself as well too and I've almost given up multiple times, but every time I don't give up it gets a little bit easier in some ways and I learn a little bit more and it becomes a little bit more clear so i hope that you know everything that's being said is having an effect on people here because it's definitely having an effect on me so i really appreciate the conversation no definitely bruce can i go on one more rant before before you go dude do you mind it'll be a short go ahead go ahead go ahead no i i think like even you know to your credit poppy like one thing when i first came into the space like you know i was looking at roadmaps and white papers and i was creating them for companies they're like hey we need a white paper we need a roadmap so my job was to go into these companies and have them articulate their vision and me to take their vision and describe it in a visual format that was easily digestible that's my job so you know kind of going into it i am supposed to be able to sell vision in like a, a moment's notice and what i realized was is since the iterative process is so quick and, and failure was happening so often for these companies that the bet wasn't on the roadmap it was on the founder and this this like took forever and i was like oh okay we're not actually betting on roadmaps that's actually not the point because a roadmap actually doesn't tell you anything because when you, you're a founder or a creator of something the vision means nothing it's the grit like ultimately when moments get really tough and i've had conversations at, at wolf web 3 all the time with new creators and you know there's a lot of opportunities and we'll be growing and uh, i always ask the same question i say i you know i hear what your opportunity is right now but where's your passion because when things ultimately get tough and they will get tough you know your opportunity and your roadmap is not going to fix the scenario it's your grit and so i say this all to say you know at, at kind of going full circle when I started looking at all these projects, I was like, man, you guys are asking the wrong questions. You're asking questions about like, what's the DEX tool? What's the DeFi tool? What's this? And when, when you're iterating through a process of like, look at Slurf, dude, this is insane. Drained, like the dude burns $10 million. The space comes around it, bails him out, and giga sends the thing to a billion dollar market cap. It's absolute insanity. And I feel like that's the the whole idea like where you've got an iterative process and it's like oh okay i just burned 10 million dollars and now you look at the founder it's like what got him there most people delete twitter account and keep going they coast through the process this guy gets on a twitter space for four hours cries in front of ten thousand people and then they bail him out and only that grit that internal deciding to face people is the thing that brought him to a billion dollar market cap not his roadmap there's no roadmap so I just, you know, this is the last thing I'll say. And man, Michael, you got me sauced up right now, dude. <laughs> you know, so the last thing I'll say is like, when you're looking at a company, you know, you, you're believing in the person, not the roadmap. The company ideas and ideals are, are perfect in a perfect scenario. But when things get tough, and they always do get tough, nobody has like a perfect ride out. And when they do, you know, they're called like trust fund bunnies. It's like kids and they end up weird and strange and they make slogans and they go to parties and they do ecstasy and they, they rub butts with their friends. Like, But for the people that actually build companies, you know, these people go through hard times and, and, and they have to figure out and iterate through the process. 
process. And so I say that all to say, that's why I think that failure process is so cool for Web3. Because they're going to start a business. It's going to be incredibly easy. People are going to throw their money at it because they want a moonbag. And then the founders are either going to fail and they're going to find out who they are in a six-month period instead of a five-year period. And you have to know who you are. You have to find out in that low moment whether you've got like the nuts to take this thing all the way. And if you see and look at some of these NFT founders, you see who it was. You look at Frank. Dude, man, he has taken it to the chain a thousand times in a row. You look at Luca Nets and you look at some of these people, and these people didn't have perfect ideas. Obviously, they're intelligent, you know. But if you look at really the core of who they are as people, is they took it to the chain and they iterated through the process. So, yeah, I just, that's why I love the innovation. I love the fact that people can fail so quickly. You know, everybody's kind of mad they want to get rubbed. And at this, Michael, this goes back to your point, like, is centralized the fix because if it is the fix those zero to one conversations for new founders are out the window and now you've got to go through a bunch of red tape to start something and that failure point isn't nearly found as fast and it's just not as fun so yeah no i, I think that's why i believe in crypto bruce what do you got man where's that party at with the ecstasy and the bump of booties and i want yeah, to go to that one that was supposed to be that that. Dude. no but but uh, you know, you, you brought up a good point. But I, I actually had this stuff written down because uh, I often uh, forget what I want to say because I'm just, I just get so amped up. But like, people have to know to pivot. You have to you have to feel that. You have to sense that. I feel these first time founders and stuff. They don't know. They don't know what it is to pivot or what it means to pivot. And and it's also you know listening to your community, but surrounding yourself with good with a good team. You have to have a good team that lays out a strong foundation. And I'm telling you, man, like you don't have to be the best founder, but if you listen to your team and you know how to pivot and you're okay with that and swallowing your pride, it can take you a long way. But that's, that's all I really had to say. Oh, and one more, one last thing. I was looking at your, 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 uh, your ex Twitter or whatever uh, profile. Like, how do you come up with uh, like your scheduling? Like I've seen you have a bunch of stuff lined up for like spaces and, and stuff. And, different uh topics and i just i don't know I, i'm wanting to to maybe start co-hosting spaces uh, uh soon or what have you but i, I kind of just want to know how do you come up with your your i guess your programming or your scheduling and, and the titles and stuff that you use yeah um I mean, or you just wing it or you just like it just comes to you Oh, dude, I pull it right out of my butt, man. Yeah, this is <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no, no, not at all, not at all. I'm going to give it the 62 minutes crash course because it's like there's a lot of pieces that go into this, and a lot of this was expertise that was brought up from God, which is the CEO of Wolf. He's hosted, you know, 40 hours of spaces for three years. He was the first spaces host when Twitter first opened. So I, I say this without hubris you know if anybody knows how to monetize and do a space it's gov he, he, he literally started it so anyway when you're talking about a space there's a couple things so this is like the two minute short version one the the speakers are the lifeblood of the space and speakers bring three things speakers bring followers speakers bring charisma and speakers bring expertise and you need all three on a stage for it to be successful and monetizable so when you're talking about creating a space uh the headline you get one single sentence to say something that's alluring to people and curiosity is a powerful tool most of the time giving the subject matter is actually less powerful than creating curiosity so be smart with your title make sure that it's something that you would be interested in something that makes you feel like what the heck is that about and then two to the sources or the speakers that you source roughly these are the metrics if you have a million followers on stage and your speakers you'll have roughly a thousand people in the space it's not always that way depending on how militant the followers are with the speakers but yada 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 but you have 13 slots to be smart about who you bring up so bring some people with expertise bring some people with charisma or we call it momentum and those people will keep the space moving in general and then you have some people who have followers and you'll need all three but if you can get all three in the right form in the right fashion and really understand what each speaker brings to the table you can start doing two three four hundred people a space and uh really to be honest like people even like kayla and uh poppy they they come to the spaces and they they offer absolute intrinsic and amazing value to a space and they're your lifeblood they come back over and over and over again and uh they really help you do this thing so to be honest and crypto billion knows this well like whenever you're doing 
spaces. It is not like a single iterative process. There's people that come around you and surround you and kind of build you up as a company and as a whole. So yeah, you know, I, I'd find a group of four or five buddies and get smart and be like, what speakers can we bring on? Like Crypto Billy, what he does really, really well is they source a main person, a draw, a pull, and then they use that main person draw because I looked at it, their speaker count for their follower count is low. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what they're doing is they're filling that gap by having really, really good subject matter and bringing on really, really good guests. You, I've, so, asked yeah. I've asked this question. I've asked 